one of the things that I realized at, as Belmont Park is we're not the size of Disneyland. We're not. We're four acres. We're seven acres, including our parking lots, but four active acres of amusement park. And I'm not going to win on the size of the park. I'm not going to win on, you know, the amount of rides that we have. Like We're not going to win on those things, but we can win on guest experience and we can win on guest service. We can have absolutely phenomenal guest service and we can bring you an extremely genuine and authentic um, experience when you come to the park. Welcome to the Attraction Pros Podcast, where we discuss the latest trends and challenges facing the attractions industry today. We chat with some of the top leaders in the field and provide resources that will help develop your career in this great industry. I am Josh Liebman. I am obsessed with the guest experience and helping attractions make that their top priority for success. And I'm Matt Heller. I am passionate about organizational effectiveness, leadership development, and employee engagement. Now sit upright, hold on tight, and get ready for the Attraction Pros Podcast. Hey, Matt, how's it going? It's going fantastically, Josh. How are you? Good. Had a little uh, Doppler effect on that, didn't I? I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> Question for you. Yes. Have you ever been somewhere where you saw or observed something that made you think, I don't know if this place really cares for me that much. Even if all the employees were, were friendly, kind of checking the boxes of, of politeness and service. I feel like I have. And as you said that, a vision flashed into my head and then it flashed out. So I don't know if I can give you a specific example. Yes, I can. Actually, yes, I can. All right. Um, goes back to our last CNC trip. I won't tell you which park it was, but I would say the the team members on on the whole were pretty good. But I just remember walking in. Well, okay. So the the initial team members that we saw for security and bag check and th stuff like that were not great, right? They did not greet us very well. But I think what, what kind of really flashed into my head was walking into the park, turning a corner, you know, heading to the first ride. And I happened to look down and there was a fence post or, a, you know, a small fence around like a planter. And there were rungs. I don't think you call them rungs on a, on a fence, but anyway, the things that go up and down on the, on the fence, poles. some were, what's that? Poles? They were pole, but they were the, the middle parts. You okay. got the poles on the end and then you got the little thing. That, somebody who is listening can tell me what those things are called. Like a post? I don't know. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, it was made out of wood and some of them were kind of rotted. Some of them, the paint was peeling. Um, as you looked closer at the planter, there was um, an area of, that was in a corner and there was like dirt that had been built up there for, it looked like quite a while. Like this was not just one time that somebody missed sweeping there. Um, and so I saw more of those scenarios as I walked around the park. And that's kind of what I, I got when, when you said, you know, they weren't really welcoming they weren't really ready. They didn't really, I don't want to say they didn't want me there, but there was a, there was a feeling like they, they, they didn't put their best foot forward when mm. it came time to show themselves off to the guests. Excellent. Thank you for, for sharing that example. The reason I bring that up is because our guest today talks about that when it comes to paper signs in an amusement park. And he specifically said, there is a lack of care for a guest with a crooked paper sign taped to a window. And I think that that is so profound because it's it's literal, but it also extends into really all the things that that you had just said, as far as like the, the things on the fence and the landscaping, just the, the overall presentation of the experience kind of diminishes the level of service within it. It does. It does. And I would also go back to something else he said, which was that, you know, kind of questioning the, the the team, is this the way we want to interact with a guest? And 
that really struck me just using the word interact there because I don't know that we think about that as a way of interacting. We think of our, our team members and our guests, right, and having a personal interaction, but any signage, any way that you can, you know, anything that the guest sees could be considered an interaction, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that was a, a, you know, a great kind of insight to the mindset of this is not how we're going to interact with our guests. Yeah. Yeah. Such a fascinating conversation, which by the way, was with Steve Thomas, <laughs> the general manager of Belmont Park in beautiful San Diego, California. Uh, Steve has been the GM there uh, now for, for a number of years, but prior to being at Belmont Park, he was working in oil fields in West Texas or East New Mexico, which is probably about as disconnected as you could be from the attractions industry and even from, from the service industry. So hearing everything that he says from a, a guest experience standpoint is so fascinating with the way that he, he developed his model for guest experience as well as for leadership, which very much came from his time in the oil fields. One of the favorite stories that I that he told, um, I won't go too far into it, was basically when he realized he was doing it wrong in terms of leadership. And um, you, you you can get a very good visual by the how he describes, you know, kind of what was going on. And um, I think it's such a great lesson uh, for leaders in terms of, first of all, being open to the fact that we're going to do things wrong, right? We're not going to do everything right. Um, but recognizing that and then doing something about it, that's the big lesson. Mm -hmm. And and then uh, the other thing he talks a lot about as well is about this, this concept of guest centricity. He says everything that we do at Belmont Park is with the guest in mind. So when he came in, he talked about how, how the park was very fragmented. There were so many different companies operating just on that one property. Uh, so he worked towards acquiring all of them and, and really uh, unifying all of all of those companies within one, which then impacted and truly enhanced the guest experience. So we get to hear about really how the park transformed from the time that the new ownership came in and, and bought the company uh, and, and now what it is today. And so do you think it's time to uh, get ready for this uh, this interview with Steve and jump right in? I think we should uh, sit up right, hold on tight as we go up the <laughs> lift hill on the giant dipper. Here we go. Hey, Steve, welcome to the Attraction Pros podcast. How are you doing today? Fantastic. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So great to have you. Great to have you on the show. Uh, let's start off with kind of the beginning and uh, your your background, your experience. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's a pretty it's a pretty interesting story. You know, I, I typically tell people that uh, I went from a roughneck to roller coasters because about seven years ago, I was working in the oil field of, of Midland, Odessa, Texas, so the Permian Basin. So I spent a lot of time in West Texas and Eastern New Mexico. And I spent about five years there until uh, one day my wife said, you know, hey, I'm tired of telling people that you exist. I would like you to, to, to get a job closer to home. And I went, gosh, man, I thought I was going to be out here forever, you know, but, you know, kind of my background has always been this transitional piece where I would I would move completely in a new direction um, every five or six years. And it was another instance of where that happened. I said, all right, well, let's go. I, I made the promise to her that if it was ever impacting our family life, that I would I would make that move. And so I did it without hesitation. And fortunately, I had a buddy call me up around that same time. He was uh, the director of, of engineering and development for a real estate company out of San Diego. And he goes, hey, we just acquired this amusement park uh, in in Belmont Park. And I go, I know exactly what it is. I, I grew up in San Diego. Um, I spent a lot of time there as a young man. And I'm not interested at all. And he's like, really? And he's like, no, you know, we had a, we had the leadership left. Um, we have all of this mechanical equipment, the rides, we don't understand how to work on them. We don't know anything about it. And they were putting pressure on the former leadership to basically let's clean up Belmont. Let's, let's take it in a new direction. We have a different vision for it. And he said, just come down and, and walk with me. And, and check it out. And so I was like, all right, I met him down at Belmont Park. Uh, it's right on the beach in between, you know, Mission Bay and the Pacific Ocean. It's a fantastic location. And I'm walking around with him and our director of construction with with Pacifica. And I go, this place is in rough shape. I mean, there was rides that were in really bad shape. There was duct tape on rides. There were whole sections of the rides being out of commission, um, but considered operational. 
And I, I looked around and I said, you know, nothing about any of this equipment scares me. I've been you know, working in the oil field. I'm very aware of big chains and gears and sprockets and all that fun stuff. But it's in rough shape. And they said, we absolutely know. We, we see that and we're aware and we want to turn this place around. And so we took a couple walk, a couple uh, minutes to walk around. And I, I thought about it and called them a few days later. And I said, all right, I'll do it. Uh, sign me up. I'm, I'm a glutton for punishment. I, I enjoy taking something that is broken and, and making it better. And so I came on as the maintenance manager. And my, my first order of business was to keep the rest of the, the rides maintenance team from leaving uh, the place. They were basically all about to walk out because they had lost the director of maintenance, the maintenance manager, and the general manager of, of the park. So I started to dig in into that team a little bit and got them rallied around the new idea of what we're trying to do and what we're trying to accomplish. And I realized very quickly that they had been poured into ever. Um, they weren't allowed to access documents of the rides, schematics, electrical schematics. Um, they had very little understanding of, of what was going on mechanically with the rides because they were always told exactly what to do and never given the opportunity to take it into their own hands and learn and grow. And so I had a, a couple of really, really interesting experiences. One was uh, I went into the maintenance you know, area that they had and they had this, this old workshop and the workbench and they're storing all the parts and pieces for all the rides. And it looked like a, a hoarder's house. There was so much stuff in there. And, and I'm like, you know, you guys need to clean this up. Like, yeah, okay, we got it. And I came in the next day and they just wiped off the, the workbench. And I went, oh, okay, we need to define clean. Let me redefine that for you. I had a 40 yard dumpster uh, brought in and I started throwing away everything that had been on the shelf for 20 years. You know, there was stuff in there like motors that were corroded and they're like, we're going to rebuild that. I was like, this will never touch one of my rides ever. You know, this goes in the trash. And so I started with the maintenance team basically creating a foundation with them, uh, getting them to understand the vision. And I worked through them one by one to see who the leader was going to be. And what was really interesting is the people you thought were next in line for the leadership, it, it wasn't any of them. And I, I went to the guy that everyone said, oh, this is the guy. I chatted with him and gave him a little bit of responsibility, you know, leaned on him a little bit. And he didn't he didn't like it or couldn't take it, didn't want to do it. I was like, oh, interesting. I went to the next guy, leaned on him a little bit. And it wasn't him. And I, I went to the guy that at the time was the lowest paid um, maintenance tech on property. And he was the lowest utilized as well. And I started leaning on him. And this kid would just absorb everything. Unbelievable. You know, he was making me Excel sheets. He was tracking when I started to build um, pivot tables to track uptime and capacity and building this reporting. And this kid was just learning so quick. And he was so bright and he, the kid, the rest of the team started respecting him. He ended up becoming my maintenance manager and is now leading not only my maintenance team, but my facilities team as well. He's got about 15 guys under him um, and he's one of the younger guys on the team. And it was just one of those cool experiences where you get to pour into somebody and you, who you think it is, it wasn't. And this kid has just been a superstar for us. And in fact, you're the only ones that know this, but he's going to win our employee of the year award this year for Belmont Park because he has that mentality of, I can do it, I'm happy to do it, and he doesn't ask you how much am I gonna get paid if I do it. He understands that he's gonna be taken care of on the back end. Um, but after about seven months of, of me being in that maintenance role, I was looking at the park and seeing it being pretty fragmented. At the time, Belmont Park was, it was, it was kind of segregated. You had a, a restaurant operation that was operated by a different operator. You had the rides, operation. So the 12 mechanical rides was a different operator. You had the attractions, which was the arcade, uh, rock wall, zip line, ropes course, escape rooms. That was a different operator. So everything was broken apart. And so I, I raised my hand to the ownership group and I said, Hey, I, I want to be the general manager of the park. Uh, I see some deficiencies on the leadership side. I had zero background on the finance uh, of what that is. I've, I've managed budgets and things like that, but actually running a giant P and L like this, I, I hadn't done before. And he goes, really? I go, yeah. And we had a conversation and, and I was thinking maybe one or two years, like give me some time to, to get my feet under me. And he called me about three weeks later and he's like, all right, take it over. You know? And so I, I jumped into the GM of just the mechanical rides portion at that time. And I spent two years uh, in basically m and I, I bought all of the small businesses inside of Belmont Park and I merged them into one company. 
So I created one park in about two years by buying the attraction operator. I bought out the restaurant and food and beverage operator. And then we created, you know, what Belmont Park could be, merged them all together. We started an HR department. I uh, started a marketing department, that, a marketing department that didn't exist before. Uh, we created an annual pass program, which had never really been thought of previously. So, so many like really neat things uh, started happening once we started to unify the park. And, you know, we can talk about vision later, but that first three years, the vision that I would roll out to the team was unification. Like, we are going to unify. We are going to unify. That is our, our single goal right now is to unify Belmont Park into Belmont Park, and then um, we can move from there. And so that was my, my original focus was to unify it. We did a fantastic job of doing that over the course of about three years. Uh, and then COVID hit, obviously, and that took us into a crazy spin. But that was my, you know, my path from, from roughneck to roller coasters was starting in the oil field and then ending up as the general manager of an amusement park. And if you would have asked me, I would, never would have guessed that I would end up as the general manager of an amusement park. Well, I want to know how you did all of that, but I know that's way too broad of a question. So to, <laughs> yeah. to kind of refine it just a little bit, can we talk about your background in the oil fields in West Texas and East New Mexico and how that experience helped to prepare you for the role that that you took on as GM of the park? Yeah, I, I got into the oil field uh, from, I was in the leadership role previously to joining the oil field. I was running a shipping and a construction department for a manufacturing facility in San Diego. And when I took on this role. It was through 2008, 2009, you know, the recession hit, it was, it was a pretty rough time and the oil field was, was starting to, to grow a little bit. And I didn't know anything about it. And just randomly, uh, this drilling company landed in San Diego doing a recruiting fair for military personnel. San Diego is a big military town. We've got the Marines here. We've got the Navy here. And so they are actually here recruiting military guys. And I heard a posting for it or my buddy did. And he goes, Hey, you want to go check this out? I was like, yeah, sure. So I went down to this recruiting fair for this drilling company. I took a couple of like mechanical aptitude tests and I did an interview and they offered me a job right there, which was a, a really, really good paying job. I was like, well, shoot, sounds good. I went home to my wife and I go, Hey, what do you think about me going into the oil field in West Texas and driving back and forth from San Diego? She goes, it sounds horrible, but if it's what you want to do, you know, <laughs> go for it. And so I, I just transitioned to the lowest guy on the totem pole into the oil field. And my mindset going into that job was I'm going to you know work as hard as I can and I'm going to move up as fast as I can uh, in this position. And I really went into that going, this is my career. Like I'm going to be into the oil field. I'm going to grow into this. It's very lucrative and there's a lot of money to be made in it. And I think I could be successful just putting my time in. So I was really anticipating like that was it for me. I was going to be in the oil field and just grow in the ranks there. Um, so once I got in, I remember, man, I walked onto the oil rig for the first time uh, in West Texas, and I went, this is that thousand ways to die show that I've seen on like Spike TV. Like everything you look at, it was just like big and sharp and heavy and dangerous and spinning and moving. And I was like, wow, this place is crazy. And I think uh, the people from Texas had an, an equally interesting time with me being from California because they didn't know anybody from California. And at the time, like, there's this really funny thing. My wife was vegan. And so she went vegan. And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll do it with you. And so I was I was vegan at the time I started in the oil field. And they had no idea what that was. Like, like, you don't eat like you don't eat meat. I'm like, no, I don't I don't eat meat. Like. At all? I'm like, no, at all. You know? <laughs> like, well, here's butter. I'm like, I don't eat butter either. Like, wait a second, you know, and it was pretty funny, but I got into that role and I just started moving up. So I started as what you call a floor hand and it's like the lowest man on the totem pole. And then within two, uh, within two hitches, they promoted me to what is called the motor hand, the guy that works on all of the engines and the equipment and make sure that they're all running smooth. And then within probably another two months, I got promoted to a derrick hand, which is like the number two in command on the rig. You work up on top of the oil rig, pulling pipe back. It's extremely scary and dangerous, but you know, it's fun too. And I did that for about, I did that for a year and I thought I was ready to be promoted to driller, which was that the guy that runs the crew, runs all the equipment, um, does all the paperwork, tracks all of, um, you know, your rate of penetration, your pressure, your downstream information, everything is, is done by the driller. 
and record it. And you also, you know, set the cadence of how the guys are working. You monitor, you monitor everything. And I didn't get this promotion to driller after a year. And I remember being pretty, pretty bummed about it. I was like, man, I'm ready. I'm better than all these guys. I should be promoted to that role. And it took me about another seven or eight months before I finally got my opportunity to, to become driller. And I remember sliding into that role as a driller after that extra time, once I got over being, you know, butthurt about it for that first few weeks. And I knew everything like the back of my hand. And I remember reflecting going, gosh, that was so worth the extra seven months of me spending in that role. Like I saw so much more uh, and I'm able to answer every question and, and people would come on like, how long have you been drilling for? I'd be like two weeks. <laughs> like, Are you serious? Like you're, like, you're doing like you, you, you do it better than most of the people I've seen doing this for years. And I just remember being like, that's really cool because I learned everything, you know, about the rest of that job that I was able to transition very, very smoothly. And it was a, it was cool. It was a moment that made me recognize like, Hey, don't, don't be bitter or upset about spending that extra time in a role. Like use that time to grow and learn as much as you possibly can, because it will translate to your success in the future. And it's having a little patience maybe is the right, the right term, Yeah, you know? Uh, and then I got into the driller and it was running the crew. And I, I think if I look back, that's really where I cut my teeth on leadership. I have like some really funny stories that I've been able to reflect on as captain of the football team when I was 17. Um, but that was when I just, I really honed that leadership skill. I have a couple moments, you know, that I, that I reflect on. One was I told the story at the panel in IAPA, but you know, I'm working with my guys and our crew is pretty productive. We're doing great. I'm probably about six months into the role of driller and we're getting stuff done and, and we're a, a pretty good crew all in all. Like I had some decent guys, but I had this attitude of like, I can do it better than you. I can do it faster than you. Uh, get out of my way because I don't want to explain it to you. I don't have time for this. Uh, we we got to get this stuff done because everything in the oil field is, is performance-based. It's time-based. It's pressure. Like you literally make more money the faster you get it done. And so that promotes a culture of, you know, a lot of unsafe action if you let it go down that path. But I, I turned around one day and I am covered head to toe in grease and oil and dirt and my other five guys on my crew were sparkling clean at the end of the hitch and i went i am doing this completely wrong i'm 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 failing not only myself but i'm failing all of them i'm not teaching them i'm not coaching them i'm not taking the time to explain their roles i don't i don't know them i don't know what they're good at you know because hey john can't do that job fine what can john do like where should he be working where he, where can he provide value for us on this crew. And so I, I went to bed that night and I went, I got to do something different. Like I really have to figure this out. And so it helped me really focus from that point forward. I was like, all right, I've got to take the time to explain things. And so I was very intentional about pulling back on what I did for people. And when I jumped in and just said, you know what, let me show you how to do that. Let me take the time to explain that to you. Let me explain why we're doing this and how it makes sense. And our productivity absolutely exploded. It was something that I, I'll remember it forever, you know, because I, I see it like it's yesterday. And I just remember making a transition from like, you know, I can do everything. I have to do everything to I need to orchestrate a team. Um, I need to spend my time pouring in to the team members and just watching them absolutely thrive, you know. And I got to the point where I became a training crew. So I was asked, hey, do you want to be a training crew? And most of the drillers would say no because it's added work. I was like, absolutely. I now had the opportunity to find the best people and train them and then like move them around. It gave me this amazing flexibility that, you know, when I worked for them, I, I couldn't hire and fire. Like that was an HR function. And so if you had guys like, yeah, you could go through the write-up process and all that, but you were much better off training somebody than you were trying to get rid of somebody. And it was a, it was kind of a forced lesson because you couldn't just go, this guy stinks. Let's get him out of here. You know, it was like, nope, I'm stuck with him. So you need to figure out how to make him the best version of himself that you can. Mm. So I started getting those training people and it also allowed me to train them properly, uh, decide if they were ready to be moved to a crew. And then also I could interchange parts and pieces. So if I came across a superstar, I was able to take one of my other guys and move them to a different crew and keep the superstar or the potential superstar. So it gave me a way to like navigate that system 
and build the best possible team I could. And I ended up getting a reputation in the oil field for being, you know, such a high functioning, high expectation team that people were wanting to be on my crew, knowing that they were going to work their butts off. It was going to be difficult, but they were going to be safe and they were going to be on one of the best crews in the Permian Basin. And I, I really came out of that with that experience, like going into leadership, looking at it in a different way. And when I walked away from the oil field uh, after those five years, I was supremely confident in my ability to lead teams and build teams and know that at the end of the day, you know, like not arrogant, but knowing like, I'm going to figure this out. I'll put in the time and the energy and the effort. I'm going to find the right people. I'm going to help coach them and mentor them. I'm going to take this path that's going to allow us to be successful. Like there isn't another option, but to be successful mm. if we do it this way. Um, and that was just, that was really, really neat. So Steve, one of the things I'm curious about, if we kind of fast forward to, to Belmont Park is, you know, you said, I want to take over the GM role. I, I, I see gaps here and I want to, you know, kind of make things right, if you will. Um, it sounds like you're probably reflecting on that oil um, oil rig experience, but I would also imagine that taking over that position as GM at Belmont Park, there was there was probably still a learning curve there. So I'm curious, what kind of things were maybe a surprise to you, or or you weren't prepared for as you took on that GM role at Belmont Park? A lot of a lot of things, <laughs> and i i went to I went and talked to my wife first, and I said, you know, hey Natalie, I'm I'm gonna take on this, I'm raising my hand for this GM role. Um, what this means is that I'm going to be working 80 hours a week for an undefined amount of time. I, I don't know. I don't know what it's going to take. And she's amazing. And she always supports me 110% with whatever nonsense I cook up, which is great. And she goes, all right. She goes, at the end of the day, you're home every night now, which mm. wasn't the case when I was in the oil field. So I had this added benefit that she was like, work whatever you want. As long as you come home every night, like we're good. And so I was like, great. I, I set that expectation up front with her. I was very clear about what it was going to take. Um, I had it set in my mind of the amount of energy and effort I was going to have to put in to not just like doing the job, but learning to do the job. And, and so I think the first step for me was going, was setting that in, in setting the right expectation for myself of what it was going to take for me to learn this new role. Uh, the challenge I ran into right out of the gate was the finance side. That was something that I wasn't strong in, I didn't have a background in finance. Uh, I, I understand numbers, you know, well enough. And basically um, I had a great background from the oil field in understanding trends. So the oil field is really good about having data. And I think that that set me up in a big way to not just look at the financial numbers, but to see the story that it's telling when you look at those financial numbers. And that's something that I think a lot of people miss is like those numbers tell a story. What is that story? Um, the first step I took with GM was I probably spent, I would start at about 4 a.m. And I would spend from about 4 a.m. till about 9 a.m. just digging into the finances of the park, every single aspect of it. Um, reading the seasonality, reading month over month information, looking at the revenue trends, looking at the, the net trends, looking at the labor trends. I was drawing graphs constantly on my whiteboard, you know, of just trying to make sense of all of it. And the challenge was that the data wasn't easy to come by. There wasn't a good system at Belmont Park to collect that data. In fact, it was it was non-existent. So I had to build my own Excel sheets and my own reporting. Um, I had a few people help me. Like I brought in a finance guy that was my right hand that I would I would ask him. I was like, Ethan, you're going to make me reports. I, I don't know what I want yet. I, I have no idea what I want to look at. I don't know what things are going to be beneficial and what aren't. So we're probably going to throw a lot of stuff in the trash at the end of this. But we'll we'll get there eventually. You know, and so I just started the process of of moving forward, collecting data, reading data, organizing it, um, trying to make sense of of everything, and then going, what are the four or five things that are really important to drive this business? And I landed on those. You know, labor percentage, cost of goods sold, uh, the overall seasonal trends of what are we doing, my ticket and wristband matrix of what are those mixes, what does my per capita spend? Like I got there, but it, it actually took me you know, probably six or seven months to get this type of the, the type of gauges I wanted to, to drive the, the business. Other than that, one of the things that really kind of caught me off guard was decision making across different disciplines. So being able to be in a conversation that's HR related or legal related and, and then walking out of that meeting into a marketing meeting 
and stretching the marketing muscle and going, well, how do I drive business? You know, and then walking into a finance meeting and discussing about how do I keep my expenses under control? And then, you know, walking into a restaurant and figuring out what the best funnel cake is right now. It was just this being pulled and stretched in so many different directions in such a short amount of time. Uh, that was a muscle that I feel like I had to develop over the course of probably a few years and just pinging from one thing to the next and being able to make pretty good decisions in each of those situations because everyone's looking to you to make those calls. And I typically, I rely on the Socratic method a lot. You know, I ask a lot of questions of my team members, the people that we work with, and I try to pull the answers out of them. So a lot of times it's, it's not me dictating, but it's just like, Hey, I'm an HR brain. Now I'm in a marketing brain. Now I'm in an operation brain. Now I'm in a food and beverage brain. You know, now I'm in a maintenance brain. This thing broke. How are we fixing it? And I think that was probably a big, a big thing for me learning and when I took over GM. Okay. And I've got to imagine that that was stretched even further as you also focused on M&A and acquiring all the businesses within the park of having to learn new departments, new division, going into you know the F&B, the retail, and, and all of the other concessionaires. Uh, but I do, I do have a question around the unification of all of that. Um, I have visited the park before, but it's been several years. So it's been prior to, to you taking over and, and you uh, taking out all this, or it was under the, the previous owner. So I'm curious as far as that fragmented experience with the number of different operators and businesses within within the property with your goal of unification tying that all together what were some of those impacts i imagine there were probably a lot of a lot of benefits on on the back end but curious as far as kind of back end as well as the front end and, and the guest experience benefits of having all of those under one umbrella as well great question i mean the simple answer it was all for the guest 100 percent. you know when i stepped onto the property and you would tell me that you know, my wristband didn't get me on the rock wall, but it got me on these 12 rides, but not those five, you know, it was extremely confusing. I was like, how does that feel from the guest perspective that I walk on and I have to navigate three or four different operators to enjoy the park? And so that was my immediate driver. And then you looked at one employee to the other employee and you go, they don't, they don't have the same values. They don't, they don't dress the same. Their uniforms are disconnected. Um, it not only like was disconnected, it felt disconnected. You know, it felt like you were walking into a strip mall more than you were walking into an amusement park. And so that was my main driver is just, it was, it stuck out like a sore thumb to me that you walk in, you go, this guest experience is broken. Um, and that drove that M&A side. It wasn't because I was some like finance business guy going, Hey, this makes the most sense. I was like, no, it only, it makes logical sense to me because it's broken today. And the guest comes in and they feel like they're in four different places. And you know, the, the employees look and act different towards you. And the guest experience is just different everywhere. Like we got to pull that together. So Steve, I'm curious where that um, guest experience focus came from, because it's probably not something you think about in the oil field, right? You know, it, it, obviously you're looking at efficiency and safety and all those kind of things. Um, but sometimes it takes people a while in a hospitality business like that to really get that 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 keen or or really critical eye for the guest experience. And you you walked in, you noticed these things right away. So I'm just curious, like where did that that ability to do that come from, or is it just kind of who you are and what you noticed? I have no idea, but it seemed like it seemed like one of those things that can't you see this? You know, doesn't this feel weird to you? Doesn't it seem strange that you know the guest has to go to six different places? Like I don't know. It seemed it seemed really really clear to me, um, and I still am that way today. And I feel like it's so easy for us to disconnect from our own place of business. Like we get jaded a little bit, and we lose sight of you know, what it feels like to be a guest, but we're really, we're really keen to it at somebody else's business. Man, I can tell you all the wrong things about this other person's business, but my own place, I'll, I'll be like, no, that's just how we do it here. Uh, but I, I mean, I worked in the service industry, probably my first job. A lot of stuff was, was mainly construction, but I just, it seemed like a, a logically broken thing in my head. Mm. And it seemed like a, a great first step. So what is your 
guest experience philosophy, or you mentioned vision earlier. What What is your guest experience vision for Belmont Park that you're working towards every day? So I, I have like the mandate that's guest centricity is something that we look at. So everything that we do is with the guest in mind. Does it make the guest experience better? And to be specific about like where we're headed next year and what how it impacts the guest is I'm really looking for the extra thing. You know, one of our core competencies at Belmont Park is um, is value. So I have safety, fun, and value. Those are the three core competencies of the park. Without those, we do not exist. Um, people don't come here. Uh, we're not effective. We're not impacting the guests in a positive way. We're, we're not even a business. And value for me is in terms of like, we provide more than you expect. Belmont Park is the place that you expected very little and you got a lot. And so what that looks like for us is I want something extra at every single um, corner of the park. Like you go and buy a ticket, you got a little extra there. You know, you got a wristband, but then we gave you like a nice pin, like something came with it that was more than you expected. You went to our sushi restaurant and we gave you a nice free dessert or there's a touch that comes with it, you know, or there's like the stamp on top of things. Like I want that feeling everywhere you go through the park. And that's something that we're working on next year. I want the guests to feel special no matter where they're at in the park. And every time they get touched by an employee, there's something extra there. There's something that's just a little bit more, you know, it doesn't have to be big. It's not always about some expensive or extravagant thing. It's just something that makes the guests go, that feels good. That was nice. I didn't expect that. So one of the things I just have to ask about, because I was out at Belmont Park probably about a year ago now, and, you know, I was kind of looking at the experience and everything. And I remember putting up a slide with the uh, in the uh, in the management meeting. And there was something that I had noticed that you, you know, I, th I think this just kind of speaks to your level of detail. And it was a paper sign that was put up someplace. And you're like, oh, I hate these paper signs. So um, again, I think it speaks to your level of detail. Can you kind of not walk us through why you hate paper signs, but what that says to you or about what that says to the guests? Yeah, I mean, the, the vision for Belmont Park is to be a world-class a world class beach boardwalk destination. Um, you can frame it as excellence, all those things. And one of the things that I realized at, as Belmont Park is we're not the size of Disneyland. We're not. We're four acres. We're seven acres, including our parking lots, but four active acres of amusement park. And I'm not going to win on the size of the park. I'm not going to win on, you know, the amount of rides that we have. Like We're not going to win on those things, but we can win on guest experience and we can win on guest service. We can have absolutely phenomenal guest service and we can bring you an extremely genuine and authentic um, experience when you come to the park. And those paper signs, uh, it's funny, but like it says so many things to me, right? There's there's a lack of care for the guest with a crooked paper sign being taped to a window. Like that that is that is how we we think that that is okay to interact with our guest in that manner. And so that's why it strikes such a chord. And I was, you know, walking around and it was kind of an interesting thing for the, the team too, is we would call it out sometimes, like, hey, that get that out of here. That sign needs needs to go. And I would explain it and some of them would fully understand it. And then it, I took the next step where we'd be on a walk and I'd walk over there and I would, I would rip the sign off of the window physically, like, and I would throw it in the trash. Well, how are we going to explain that, you know, that window is closed? I don't know, but I bet you, you can go on Amazon and find some sort of a holder that you can slide the paper in, or we can laminate it and make sure it's square and installed in a very nice, clean way, you know? And so it was one of those things that just highlighted uh, kind of a deficiency in our culture. It wasn't just, it wasn't just like the paper sign and how we treated the guests, but it was also like my team wasn't quite getting it yet. And so I wanted to make it very, very clear that that was unacceptable. It was unacceptable for us to treat the guest that way, that they deserve it better than that. You know, they're coming here and they're spending their hard-earned money with us. They chose us today. Like, let's make sure that we, we treat them with care and kindness and, you know, we give them what they deserve. Hmm. I, I feel like just this example of a paper sign, it's it's literal. Like, it's like it, it, it literally is the, the paper sign on the window, et cetera. But it can also really be expanded out into... I don't know about this like metaphor, but kind of like this philosophy into whatever your work area is. Are you putting up a paper sign, you know, and, and taping it to the window, or are you taking that extra care? So I'm kind of curious as far as how you you take this concept of of no paper signs, and I put in air quotes, and 
and turn that into the the philosophy that can then be really brought down even to the to the frontline staff in the intangible service interactions that uh, you know that that they mm-hmm. have. I think that you can take that same philosophy and you know it's it's like no. Uh, you know, pointing to a location. It could be, no, we walk them there if we're not in a safety position, something like that. It's the same philosophy as, as the no paper sign. So curious as far as really how you how you take that and expand that out to all of those very granular touch points that the guest interacts with throughout the day, where it could be a paper sign or it could be that something extra that you talked about earlier. Yeah, no, it's a good point. I, I think personally, I land on uh, picking up trash. Like that one for me is exactly what you're describing. And I, I mentioned that to a lot of people, like we do not walk over a piece of trash ever. I don't do it. Nobody does it. And and it's that it's kind of that same thing is that it's it's because we care about the guests so much. Um, I care about this place that much. I will never walk over a piece of trash. And I have the entire team now. They walk through and I get to, you know, catch them in the act of stopping. You know, I, I love the thought process because we all have it. Like I could just walk over that, but I shouldn't walk over that piece. Of, all right, I'll pick up a piece of trash. You know, you take it over the trash can and throw it away. Um, but it, it is, it's great. It's, it's, it's those little things that, that, that really resonate with the team uh, and they understand when we do it as leaders, like that's what hits them. When they watch, you know, you, Matt, or myself, or whoever, when we walk over and we rip the, that paper sign off the window, that makes an impact. Like, we immediately clarified, you know, the, or I guess we immediately defined what we mean by no paper signs. No, no paper signs. I'm going to rip them off if I see the paper signs. So you need to figure out another way to do it. Um, but there's a there's a point like of doing it physically and then helping them understand the why, you know. And sometimes people don't know how to to actually execute on it. And I've seen that often where I'll run into it. And I'm, man, I'm explaining this to you. I see that you get it, but you're not. You're still not doing it. Why is that? And then you run into like, oh, like well, you don't actually know how to do it, you know. And it goes back to that maintenance team and. And I show them and define clean for them. I spend a lot of time defining the vision for the team and going, I said, world-class, great. Uh, I did an exercise with our director team where I had them all go take pictures of things that weren't world, world-class world throughout the park and then take pictures of things that were world-class. And we got together and we created our definition of what world-class looks like, you know, physically in real life. And so now if we have those conversations with our team, they know what it looks like. We're all on the same page. We're all completely aligned on what world-class looks like to us. Maybe it's not perfect, but it's headed in the right direction. Um, and, you know, I've taken a few steps with the vision. I created this thing called like a vision wheel. And it's it's kind of goofy, but it says, you know, tech forward, guest centricity, um, world-class culinary experience, or authentic culinary experience. And so those things speak to the team. Everything is branded. So it gives my teams, they're able to go, should we brand that cup? Yes, everything is branded. Like, what about the paper inside of, you know, the basket where the chick, everything is branded, you know? Yeah, but what if everything, like, oh, got it. Like, everything is branded, you know? And the authentic culinary side is like, hey, uh, we're going to go get the frozen churro from, you know, Cisco. They have this really great deal. Like, no, we're not. It's authentic. Is that authentic? Have you gone down to Baja? Let's go down to Baja. What kind of churros are they serving down in Baja? Because that's that's who we are. That's what I want. We want that churro here. It's homemade. It's fresh. It comes out. They're smaller. They look great. And that is San Diego, not the frozen churro that is at every amusement park across the nation. Hmm. Not interested. You know, so those things I, I put in this way, being tech forward, you know, we had, uh, when I first started, we had this issue with like, hey, we have the version of the POS system from 1982. I'm like, okay, you know, I'm like, that's good. You know, I, I I get it. We're probably missing some things from 82 <laughs> to 2019. <laughs> and, and, and so it was a, a, an expense thing. Well, it's it's expensive. I'm like, it, yeah, but I think we're probably losing more money than we're saving by not having the most current information and data and all of that stuff. And so I made tech forward one of those pieces of the vision wheel that we're always thinking tech forward, whether it be app, data collection, analytics, um, you know, softwares that we use, just the experience for the guest, like our content creation and our marketing. I'm extremely um, very tech forward when it comes to how we make content. I want, I want our guests to interact with Belmont before they get here and not look at pictures, but like interact. I want there to be a digital experience for them. 
um, through our, our marketing and our content. And so I've made that part of our, our vision wheel at the tech forward side and then expand beyond Belmont borders. I mean, I mentioned four acres is all I have. Our team goes down to Baja every year and we build houses um, for people down in, in Mexico. And there's ways that Belmont Park can expand beyond that four acres. And I'm always searching for it. It's both on the business side. It's it's how we interact with our community, how we're a part of the community. And it's just always thinking that we are we can be bigger than we are. And we can do, do different things. We can think differently. We can expand in different ways. Like, let's not get stuck in our four acre box. Steve, one of the things that I would love to kind of dive into here is, you know, you mentioned when you first started, you started working at four o'clock in the morning and you were diving into the finances. And, um, you know, your wife said, as long as you're home at night, that's that's what we want. That's that's the that's the measure of success. Um, but I'm curious now with you leading a team of other leaders, you know, maintaining your own work life balance, but also seeing their work life balance and how do you encourage them you know, maybe there's a time when they have to come in early or stay late. And, you know, we know that's going to happen in this business, but, you know, on balance, how are, how are you encouraging them to also, you know, maintain the balance so that they're as effective as they can be when they are there? I'm not good at this. So <laughs> right out of the box. Uh, I don't, so it's two different things for me. Like, let's talk about it, me personally. Like, I, I don't believe in work-life balance. I believe in work-life integration. I, I have, you know, my priorities and they're very clear to me. Like I've got my faith and I've got my family, I've got my career and those are my focuses. Um, Netflix is not a priority to me, you know, um, professional sports watching is not a priority to, to me. Like those things are a waste of my time. So I, I really look at how I prioritize my time and my day and, and I focus and I'm very in, in, intentional with how I spend that time. But I don't ever see there being a line of like, I don't want to work because I just want to do nothing. You know, that doesn't make any sense to me. So I, I really like land on this work-life integration and I promote that here in a big way. And it's a little bit of a crossover to answer your question, but my kids come to work with me uh, during the summertime. Uh, they work here, they're 12 and 10, like they're very young, but that, you know, I've got some great people here that they, they jump on board with and they're like actually helping and contributing and uh, helping around the park. And I don't have any problem with that. And, and all of the employees have the same opportunity and path. Um, I want your family to be a part of your life as much as possible. And if they want to come to, I'm totally okay with that. Um, I trust that a lot of the people here are going to be able to get their jobs done, you know, and so they can, they can work from home. I don't have like a, a work from home policy, but man, if you have to take your kids to school, by all means, take your kids to school. There, there's not a, you don't have to be here at 9 a.m. in a seat. You know, I think that's a pretty antiquated thought. And so I'm very flexible when it comes to that. And I'd like to bring on people that I trust and give them the ability to manage their life and their work the way they see fit. And so I hope that they don't run into this idea that there's one or the other, right? Like I, I, I'm either working or I'm having my life and it's different. It's like if you have to get your oil changed, go get your oil changed. Like, please, you know, nobody's, you're not gonna get a write-up for you know, getting your oil changed. There's some pretty funny thoughts, but as far as the amount that I work, like that's where I, I, I fall. I work a lot and I enjoy it. You know, there's, I, I feel like I'm truly living my purpose. And so it's not difficult or, or challenging or, or something that I feel like I need to, to do less of. Um, and I always encourage the team to find the right amount of it for them. So it, it's not easy to say like everyone wants to throw work-life balance out there. And I had a, I went through a whole exercise mat, which was really interesting because I, I wanted definitions. Like that's where mm -hmm. I land all the time. I was like, please define work-life balance for me, because if you don't have it, how do we help you get there? And I got some really interesting answers. One of which was, uh, I don't work enough. I was like, Oh, it goes that way too. Right? Like people weren't getting as many hours as they wanted at a particular time. So they actually wanted more work. And then the other one was, I like working with people um, that I enjoy working with. And I was like, okay. So work-life balance meant enjoying your time at work. It didn't mean not working. And so I was like, okay, that's good to know. And then some of it was, yeah, like I work too much, but it's my own fault. Like I am 
the one spending that much time. I'm making the decision to stay those extra hours. Like nobody else was putting that pressure on me. So I feel like a lot of people land in that box, which is they're they're their own, you know, they're their own reason for not having work life balance. So I like to focus my with my team on prioritization. Like, are they prioritizing their day? Are they intentional about their day? Um, and then are they honest with themselves about how they're spending their time? So those are the two places that I go first. And what I mean by being honest is like, if you're spending four hours a day on social media, uh, I don't, it, it's not work's fault. Like you're not using that time that's impacting your personal life, like in a good way. Like you just burned four hours on social media that could have been with your family, with your kids, with, you know, doing something that does really feed your soul, like whatever it is. And so I like to really push them there first. Like if you're binge watching Netflix all weekend and then you don't feel refreshed when you come into work on Monday, is that lack of work-life balance? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't buy it, you yeah. know? And, and so that's, that's usually where I go with the team first is like, let's go through your list of priorities. You know, and I, I love the Eisenhower matrix. And if you guys have seen that, it's like a four blocker, urgent and important, urgent, yeah. not important. So I use that exercise on a regular basis with the team and I'll, and I'll do that with them. Like, Hey, let's do the, do a four blocker. Like, show me like, and they, they write out their list and sometimes they, they go, that's not that bad. Oh, man, it's not, it's not that bad. You know, it's, it's really not that much stuff. You know, sometimes everything lands in the urgent and important. And I go, is it? You know, is it really all in that bucket? And they're like, well, no. And I go, no, it's not, you know? <laughs> and so it really just helps frame and give give people perspective. And so prioritization and, you know, being honest about how you're spending your free time, I think are important steps to take when you're looking at work-life balance. Steve, we are coming close to the end of the interview here, but I do feel like it is important to touch on one final thing, and that is the fact that Belmont Park is going to be turning 100 years old very soon in 2025. And I'm wondering if you can give us a, a quick preview, a quick uh, snapshot of what people can expect for the uh, the centennial. We're still working on it. So we started in 1925. Um, I'm working with our marketing team to develop you know, like a big concert series and a bunch of fun stuff at the park to really memorialize that hundred year anniversary for the city of San Diego, like having the city officials here. I'm working on getting a, a Belmont day proclamation with the city of San Diego, which would, which would be really, really fun, but I'm excited about it. I really feel um, honored and, you know, blessed to be a part of Belmont parks, hundred year anniversary. It, 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 it holds some significance and the team here is finding it as a great rally point. And I hope that they all see that, that at the end of the day, you know, Belmont Park started in 1925. We're part of the 100-year anniversary. That's pretty neat. We get to kind of memorialize that as the team that brought it to that 100 years. And then there's going to be another, you know, 100 years in between there. We're going to move on and things are going to happen. But it's a special time for Belmont Park. And, and that's what's important to me is, is not so much as, you know, all of the, the external stuff, but internally having this team rally around the idea that they're a part of, of something that's, you know, we're small and we're just a little beachside boardwalk, but it's a special time um, there. And it's something that you will remember in, in 20, 30 years from now, like we had this push, we created something special and we got to really like, you know, raise the flag of the hundred year anniversary for Belmont Park and, and do something neat for it. Well, like Josh said, uh, Steve, we're running a, a little low on time, but we definitely want to give you an opportunity to uh, share any contact information or ways to learn more about Belmont Park. So if you wanted, if people wanted to get in touch with you or learn more about Belmont Park, where would you send them? Uh, they could go to belmontpark.com, uh, check out our Instagram at belmontparksd, or you can email me directly, steve at belmontpark.com. Always happy to, to chat and love learning new things and you know, if anyone has any insight or thoughts or just wants to share something or hear about Belmont, I'm happy to, to chat with them. Awesome. Steve, thank you so much for uh, sharing that info and for sharing all of your leadership insights, your guest experience insights, and, and just everything throughout this interview. This was just so fascinating. So we really appreciate you taking the time today to, to talk to us. And for everyone out there who is watching and listening, just remember, we are all attraction pros. Thanks for listening to the Attraction Pros podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you can tune in when new episodes release. And even better, please leave us a review on iTunes. 
For more information, visit attractionpros.com.